Well, today we are in chapter number seven. We're at the end of the uh, first priority, a personal progressive commitment to Jesus Christ. And a big part of that uh, commitment is the whole area of giving. Uh, we titled this chapter, Why Do I Need to Give? If I retitle it, I take a title from a buddy of mine who said, Don't Mess With My Stuff. And so let's talk about why we don't want God or anybody else to mess with our stuff. A um, couple of humorous things. Uh, let me share these with you in, in the whole area of giving and money. Someone said a dollar goes, uh, does go farther these days. You can carry it around for a week before you can find anything you can buy for it. Boy, isn't that true. The other, uh, the other day a guy said, I received a collection letter. Uh, we're surprised we haven't heard from you, they wrote. The guy wrote back and said, don't be surprised. I didn't send anything. <laughs> I love it. Uh, let's face it, another man said, there's only one thing money can't buy, poverty. You need credit cards to do that. Wow. Prices are unreal, the man said. Would you believe that the Girl Scouts now offer a cookie layaway plan? Ooh. Maybe I worry too much about money. But you'd worry too if your wife was just elected to the MasterCard Hall of Fame. Well, that says it all right there, doesn't it? Let me give you some deeper thoughts uh, from some of my uh, mentors over the year about giving and about money. Fred Smith said it this way. Giving is the drain plug for our greed. Steve Brown said, if I can see your checkbook, I can tell you about you. Fred Smith again said, we need to give in order to develop spiritually. Steve Brown said, benevolence is the gauge of righteousness. And then Fred Smith said it this way, there's an advantage in teaching people to give when they have very little. Generally, they are the ones who keep giving when they have a great deal. So this whole subject of giving, you know, I've, I've thought about what I wanted to, uh, to talk about here for a few minutes, and let me give you a few guidelines that aren't in your chapter, and then I want to tell some stories to end with, and, and, and that, that's kind of what we'll do today. But let me give you just some, some, some ideas about giving some principles that I think would be important. Number one, one must not wait until he makes or she makes big money to start giving. You don't have to be rich to give. Give what you've got to give. I, I remember when I was in graduate school, I had a professor come in class one day and talk about um, giving and about how to just kind of budget your time and your life and so forth. But I'll never forget what he said. He said when he and his wife got married, the first thing they did is they laid out their budget, their weekly and monthly budget, was the first check they wrote was the check that they gave towards the Lord's work to their church. So that was a great guideline for me. Let me give you another one. Few men who wait to give ever really give. Few men who wait to give ever really give. And so again, you know, I, and I, I say this very cautiously, but I, I, I know very few wealthy men who are generous men. I know... Also, a lot of wealthy people that I've met over the years in different cities around the country, especially in the context of church, who have been very critical and very demanding people of their church, but when the truth was told, they gave very little or nothing. So again, we need to guard our hearts on that. A man by the name of Maxie Jarman said this one day, a very successful man, he had given millions of dollars to Christian causes. In the latter part of his business life, he had some reverses. During this temporary period, I asked him, a friend asked him, if he ever thought about the millions he had given away now that he was not as wealthy. He replied, of course I have. But remember, I never lost a dollar of the money I gave. I only lost what I kept. And so again, um, I think of another story that, it's kind of right in line with that. I had a friend named David, still have a friend named David, and a number of years ago when uh, we were starting the gathering of men, which is our outreach uh, around the country to men, uh, and this book, The Four Priorities, is a product of that ministry, The Gathering of Men. 
which is headquartered in Orlando, Florida, and located in other cities around the country. But anyway, David uh, came to me one day and he said, you know, I think this gathering of men concept would go all over the country. He said, as long as I've got money, I will help underwrite you training other men, potential leaders around the country to start gathering them in operations in their city. And so, David, we bring in, say, 15, 20 men into uh, Dallas or Orlando, and David would underwrite their travel, put them up in a nice hotel, pay for their food, and then would pay for me to go to those cities to further train those gentlemen to start the gathering of men in those locations. I'll never forget asking David one day, I said, David, I all this, this backing that you gave us, uh, I, I mean, it's just amazing. And he was kind of going through a hard time at that time financially. And he said almost exactly the same thing as Maxie Jarman. The only money I didn't lose was the money I invested in the gathering of men. And the gathering of men, based upon what David and others have done over the years, have impacted thousands of men around this country. God used their generosity and still uses that generosity to make that happen. Someone said it this way, you know you have become a true giver when you get as excited about giving and a giving opportunity as you do about a good investment opportunity. A couple other thoughts, some uh, basic biblical principles about giving. Giving from the heart is investing with God. Giving from the heart is investing with God. Uh, check out Luke 6.38, another one. Genuine giving is to be sacrificial. Check out 2 Samuel 24, 24. Someone has said, Generosity is not measured by the size of the gift itself, but by its size in comparison to what is possessed. Check out Mark 12, 41 to 44. You know, one of the things over the years that uh, I have learned is to learn to give by faith. Now, what do I mean by that? I often pray at the beginning of a year as I set out my priorities and goals in light of these four priorities that we're studying that um, God would help me be able to do certain things, reach certain goals, and one of those is in the area of finances. And I pray, Lord, I, this year I would like to give this amount. I don't know where all that's going to come from, the ability to be able to give that, but by faith, Lord, I pray that you would give me the opportunity by, by giving me uh, the uh, funds that I need to be able to give that kind of gift. And it's been amazing over the years how often I've been able to meet or exceed that goal because God honored by faith that goal that I had asked him for. And so, again, that might be something that you uh, think about. Another one, responsibility for giving has no relationship to how much a person has. Check out Luke 16, 10. Someone else said, if there is love and caring in your heart, you will be a generous giver. Another principle, material giving correlates to spiritual blessing. I didn't say material blessing necessarily, but spiritual blessing. Check out Luke 16, verse 11 through 12. Another principle, we are to give in response to need. Make sure there is true need, and then give, led by God's Spirit in your heart. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 Encouraging indolence weakens the character. Let me give you another principle. Giving demonstrates love, not law. The New Testament does not give us a command in terms of the specific amounts we need to give, but the Scripture does say God uh, encourages and loves and cares about a person that has a cheerful heart and is a cheerful giver. So you think about that as you give. And, um, you know, I guess that's about all those little principles I want to give you. But let me ask you a couple uh, questions that you might um, also want to ask about giving. Do I really believe there is a need when I look at a particular opportunity? Two, am I responding out of pressure or because I really care? Three, is my gift an appropriate expression of my income, or is it more of a last-minute, unplanned, get-it-over-with act? Number four, have I prayed, or is this impulsive giving? Five, is joy prompting me? Am I genuinely thrilled about what God is going uh, to do through my life as I give this gift? Six, does generosity characterize 
my life. Well, let me close with a couple of illustrations that have meant a lot to me over the years. And by the way, in the I am told that in doing some research and some of the passages in Matthew, especially the passages deal with giving, um, it is said that there was a special out-of-the-way place in the temple where shy, humble Jews could leave their gifts without being noticed. Another place nearby was provided for the shy poor who did not want to be seen asking for help. Here they could uh, come and, 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 and take what they needed and then give what they wanted. The name of the place was called the Chamber of the Silent. People gave and people were helped, but no one knew the identities of either group. You know, there's a great lesson in that I think we need to remember, that uh, don't make a big deal about your giving. You don't have to have a name on a building or have somebody applauding you, or don't have to have your name in the paper or a bulletin. Just give. Learning to be anonymous as much as possible and giving I think the Lord honors that. Um, I met a man a number of years ago, along with my good buddy Larry Kreider, that was a significant contributor to the Four Priority book. And this man was a man that lived in South Florida. And he was a contributor and had been con a contributor to the Gathering of Men efforts for a number of years. And I told Larry one day, I said, I think we need to, need to go down and see this man. So we flew down and just wanted to thank him and take him to lunch. And so as we sat in his office, and he had been in, uh, uh, one of his businesses was, uh, he had a huge banana company. And he had sold that company and uh, was doing some other things in business. But he was a generous man. And I'll never forget asking him as we sat in his office. I said uh, to him, I said, do you have a lot of requests for giving? He said, yes, let me show you how many I have. So he went into his inner office. And a few minutes later, he came out. And he had in his hands a shoebox. The lid was off the shoebox, and in the shoebox, very neatly stacked but crammed in there, were a row of envelopes packed in to that shoebox. And he looked at us and he said, this is how many requests I get for money every month. I said, well, does this just wear you out? He said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, this is a highlight of my life. He said, I go through every request prayerfully and try to give to every person that asks for help or for a contribution. We call that man the banana man, the banana man, the generous man. And I remember I have another friend in another state who heard me tell that story one day. And I'll never, I hope he listens to this video because I won't mention his name, but he will know it if uh, he listens to this. And I told that story about the banana man, and he came up to me after the talk, and he said, I want to be the next banana man. Well, maybe you can think about that, too. Maybe you could be the next banana man. One final story. I used to work in Houston, Texas, and when I was there one uh, uh, Thanksgiving, the day before Thanksgiving, there was a man that worked on the staff there. He worked in a custodial area of the life of this big church in Houston, and his name was Pappy. Uh, Pappy is now with the Lord, uh, but he was a dear, dear man, and probably was maybe 85 years old, and he had finally gotten to the point in his life where he couldn't do much physically, but he was the guy that would go around and polish the brass doorknobs all over the church property, and I mean those doorknobs were beautiful. So anyway, there was a knock on the, my office door one day, and I was meeting with a man, a very wealthy man, and Pappy who was kind of hunched over at this point uh, in his life, uh, put his head in the door and he said, Dr. Tolson, he said, I've got your turkey for you for Thanksgiving in the refrigerator in the kitchen here at the church. Happy Thanksgiving. And then he closed the door. Well, I looked over at my friend and my friend was weeping. And after he kind of composed himself, I said, why are you weeping? He said, because I have so much and often give so little. He has so little and gives so much. You think about that real hard.